And there is an overflow room. working on the tradi traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Coast Salish people. Before we begin, just like uh, opening remarks, um, because at the beginning of this year we have um, live streaming, so this meeting is being live streamed and the audio and visual recording will also be available to the public for viewing after the meeting. The footage of the meeting may be viewed inside and outside of Canada. Please be aware the microphones could pick up private conversations and should be turned off when not in use. Before we introduce um, ourselves, our, the committee members, to all um, uh, the people here today, I just wanted to go over some uh, meeting decorum that we we have written in our policy as well, the board policy, and just about decorum so the, the meeting runs smoothly. Uh, dele delegations and the members of the committee speaks through the chair, so to avoid cross discussion, it, everything comes to the chair, that's myself. There will be civility, civility towards each other because we are here to absorb information to help us in our decision making in the future. There's no decision making on uh, most of the topics that our people are here in attendance for this evening. Uh, staff will be presenting a number of reports this evening, so um, the, the board and the committee members res respects that and uh, without influence or pressure, uh, staff is, is encouraged and we appreciate their reports. That helps the board, their professional reports. Uh, so basic common sense of professional and courteous manner during the meeting. Just want to introduce, not introduce, but welcome, because I don't know where they are, um, Francis Bula's um, Langara journalism class. I think, oh, oh very good. Uh, they come to a number of committee, usually to the board meetings as well. So we appreciate them uh, for coming in and reporting out. I think that covers all the items required prior to the meeting. Um, so for everyone here in attendance in this room and the next room, um, I think it's important that we, we introduce the committee members. So there's one delegation this evening and that delegation has 10 minutes. Um, unusual, but the, the delegation usually um, comes at the same day that we have the staff's report on that agenda item. But uh, the delegation said it's, it, it was crucial for them to come earlier so we can get the information with regards to Eric Hamber. So that's why we have a delegation. And that's also why at the end of the delegation presentation and any questions from committee members, we'll have a five minute break unless uh, the Hamber uh, group and Hudson Group would like to um, to leave or they can stay as well. So there will be a five minute break after the first delegation presentation. Before we begin delegation presentations, if we can go, the committee members can introduce themselves and uh, their organization they represent. All right, so I'm Alan Wong and chair of committee two. No, we don't call it committee two, we call it facilities and planning committee now. Okay, to my left. Uh, Jim Mesquina, director of facilities. Uh, Lois Chan Pedley, trustee. Barb Parrott, trustee. Carmen Cho, committee member. Oliver Hansen, vice chair of the committee. John Dawson, director of educational planning. Adrian Keogh, director of instruction. Hazel Bangilina, student trustee. Fiona Chang, VDSC representative. Anne Montgomery, DPAC. Lisa Landry, assistant secretary treasurer. 
Ben Boyd, QP 407. Uh, Jill Barkley, uh, Vancouver Elementary School Teachers Association. Terry Stanway, Vancouver Secondary Teachers. Harjinder Sandhu, Vancouver Elementary Principals, Vice Principals Association. Suzanne Hoffman, Superintendent. David Nelson, Deputy Superintendent. Fraser Ballantyne, Trustee. Jennifer Reddy, Trustee and Committee Member. Estrelita Gonzalez, Trustee. Janet Fraser, Trustee. David Green, Secretary Treasurer. And staff on the side as well. Rob Schindel, Associate Superintendent. Jody Langua, Associate Superintendent. Carmen Batista, Associate Superintendent. Jansen Ho, Project Director. Chris Wong, District Principal. Patricia McNeil, Director of Communications. Thank you, everyone. And um, just a note that Estrelita Gonzalez, Trustee Gonzalez, has a meeting later on. So uh, she will be exiting uh, towards the end of the meeting. OK, thank you, everyone. Um, so delegation uh, from Eric Hamber Secondary School Seismic Project, Stephanie Yada. Uh, Eric Hamber Pack, Stephanie, is, there you are. Um, just before this, as stated earlier, the, the, the report from, from staff will be coming, not in this meeting, but the, the, the February meeting. Yes, thank you yeah, for thank allowing you. us. Thank you. Thank you for adding us to the agenda today. Uh, the urgency really is based on the timeline that we're dealing with for our uh, seismic mitigation project. Uh, so Andrea Nicholson, she is going to uh, speak first. And she, go ahead. Yeah. I'm the Eric Hamber Alumni Coordinator. So uh, Stephanie and I actually are Hamber grad class members as well. So we are still very involved in our school. And thank you for having us uh, today. We appreciate it. So I'll just start with our, our position. Uh, the many students. Oh, uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> the many students who have come through the doors of Eric Hamber in the past 56 years have established their traditions that have contributed to the wonderful learning environment that distinguishes Eric Hamber. They have truly made this school a worthy successor to King Ed School. Our students are proud to be Griffins, and we can see them here today, and carry on the traditions that were established by those who preceded them. That sense of pride, the strong personal connections, and the pursuit of excellence in all endeavors has remained unchanged. The alumni have been strongly invested, passionate, and a constant voice and support of the Eric Hamber community for decades, recently organizing the 50th anniversary and gym dedications. We are here to work with you and work with the board in any way we can and hope for open communications going forward. The current students care about Hamber traditions, history and Hamber legacy. They are inspired and respect the gym dedications to Nora McDermott and Bruce Ashdown. Alumni and students designed the graphics, they were painted, and the McDermott family provided a generous donation for the floor. Those dedications we feel must be brought forward to the new school. We are concerned about the future of this amazing established school. The alumni insist, please, on being included on the full process going forward. We voiced our concerns regarding alumni inclusion after the media release, and still we have not been brought to the table. Slow this project down is our ask to thoroughly investigate all concerns and options. We'd like to work with you. Include all major stakeholders and the community. Open uh, public consultation is an absolute must. Place the new build in the originally discussed location as one of our solutions, the northeast corner of the property at 33rd and Willow. The new build could then be attached to the 2005 wing and there would be no disruption of the district-wide fashion program, music, choir, dance and more. The parking should then be placed underground and this way we would, we would be able to save the field. Space lost in the, and basically the track and refurbish that to serve both the community and the school community. 
Numerous teams, groups, and individuals use that track and the Hamber Fields always in any weather. Alumni have stated to myself that they feel that the use of the existing building as a seismic swing space in order to save millions seems to have become the priority rather than the building of the right build for Hamber. Designate a portion of the $16 million to be saved by keeping Hamber in its existing building to create the proper footprint size and design to at least allow Hamber to have the facilities it currently has, let alone with some insight to the new expected future growth of our neighborhood. We have capable in-house talent in the board. Redirect the thousands that we spend for external consultants to save situations like this from occurring in the future. Put that money to our students, our staff programs, and to appropriate new school builds. We want to build the right build. We don't want to downgrade our school. Advocate pleas to the city and local developers to fund through CA contributions for a much needed community centre. So Hamburg is rebuilt as a community school. That way we could create a school and community legacy to serve for generations to come. We need immediate advocacy from you, our elected trustees. We need that support. That's why we voted you in and we hope that we can work with you. The BBE has noted that they're concerned, they have concerns with the flaws in the area standards document. Why would we go ahead and build what does not meet the needs of the current school and be short-sighted to consider the future? It is obvious that the current and confirmed housing builds and proposed family housing projects for this community have not been taken into serious account. We, will bring, we would like you to bring forward a motion for an emergency intervention of the seismic Eric Amber project and we would hope for your support in that. So. Hamber families are thrilled to finally be getting a seismically safe school, a state-of-the-art facility designed for 21st century learning. Who wouldn't be excited about getting a brand new $80 million school? Parents want to move forward with a revised plan for a larger school that will house the existing programs at Eric Hamber. In order to achieve this, we need your help. We need you as elected trustees to represent us, to advocate for students and their families. It's why we voted for you. It's what you were elected to do. We know you want to provide our children with the best possible education. You wouldn't have run for office if you didn't want this. Right now, you are in a position to actually make a difference in the lives of tens of thousands of children for generations to come. Right now, we fortunately have a provincial government that is committed to keeping our children safe by investing millions of dollars in seismically safe schools. We need you, our elected trustees, to make sure that these millions of taxpayer dollars are being used to build better schools, not inferior ones, better schools where our children will thrive for the next 50 plus years. We need you to ensure there will be spaces for more positive, enriched educational experiences, not fewer opportunities for our children. Parents don't want to take away space from a new school library that's already being reduced by 45%, or pit academic classrooms against spaces for the arts, or reduce the number of student huddle spaces. We don't want to lose programs that, we ben that have benefited young people for over 50 years due to a lack of space. What we want is more area added to the current design, so essentials like an auditorium, gymnasiums, a track, fields, spaces for the arts, for music, drama, art, fashion design, dance, photography, film studies, that these can be included. Build it so our children will be able to flourish in the 21st century. We know it can be done and it's up to you to help us. It seems unfair to us that the new Kitsilana Secondary was built to accommodate 13% fewer students than our school, but is 20% larger than the proposed new Eric Amber. Why does New West Secondary, which is currently under construction, have a 30% bigger budget, 33% more space to accommodate only 11% more students? 
than Eric Hamber. It's so unfair that these new builds have auditoriums, ample gym space, ample outdoor space, and lots of spaces for the arts, and we do not. We know that you agree with us that the area standards set by the previous government in the early 2000s needs to be revised. We know that the Ministry of Education agrees and has committed to do this. So why is Hamber being built using these short-sighted and outdated guidelines? Parents want the same things as you do. We want to do what's best for our kids. As our petition states, we want to work in collaboration with the trustees and the Vancouver School Board to ensure the new Eric Hamber is built to accommodate future generations. And we've come up with a possible solution. Using the existing Eric Hamber as a future swing site is saving the province millions of dollars. Without this space, the expedited aggressive seismic timetable cannot be achieved. According to the CBC News, the province says keeping students in the school rather than moving them to portables will save about $16 million. It says other options would require a phased approach, approach, which means a longer construction time and a higher price tag. If you multiply this by the number of schools that will use Hamber as their swing space, the province will be saving tens of millions of dollars. We would like to propose that some of that money be put back into the Air Cameron build to get seismic right. What we need is an emergency intervention. We need you as, trust, as, as trustees to make a motion to advocate on our behalf to get Hamber built right. Thank, thank you, Stephanie and Andrea. I'm gonna open it up for um, questions and questions basically from uh, committee members. Um, there's a lot of information floating around and I, I think a lot of trustees and, and members are, were just absorbing the information and it's it's going to staff as well. And it, the actual report's coming at the next meeting. So uh, questions might be limited or might there might be quite a few questions, uh, but if uh, committee members have any questions for Stephanie and Andrea, if we can focus on questions directly to the delegation, staff um, questions will be for the next meeting, or if you would like to have a state of question, then we can notate that, but staff, I don't think it's the appropriate day today to answer um, questions from committee members, but Anything uh, you have should be forwarded to staff as soon as possible. So I'll open it up from committee members. Anne? I just wanted to go back to the comment that you made about putting a new building attached to the newer portion of the existing Hamburg. Is that ever brought up as a possible solution? Years ago, that was a thought for that when that seismic, when that building that was the original thought. Um, so it just seems that when it became a complete rebuild, that has changed depending on what communication we've been provided to, which sometimes is not. But that was a good option that we thought. Also that hammer track area, uh, because of the underground water that we have, it has always been an issue on the corner of 33rd and Oak. It floats, it has always been a problem. So that's why we thought as well, the light on 33rd and Oak was put in after a Hammer student was killed. And there were many hit in that corner before. So to have access to a school just on that busy corner is another concern as well. Yeah. A question with regards to, uh, uh, both of you referenced the um, emergency intervention seismic air Hammer project group. There is a school group, um, is this, Different from that, or are you just encouraging this group to have more meetings? I'm just. I uh, know it's, di it's different. Uh, so I am part of the uh, advisory committee of the right. member, and um, I think again the urgency comes from the timeline. So as part of that committee, we were told that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> as part of the committee, we were told that the design. Um, it's gone to RFQ and the design will be finalized by the end of March. So it's really not much time. And uh, so that, that's the concern. 
uh, but the group is this, this is the same group, right? The, the school group. Um, or are you proposing actually, a separate group? We're asking um, trustees to call that so that it can be slowed for now so that proper investigation and, and consultation can be uh, heard because we're concerned of the, the RFQ dates as well. So we're asking that trustees call that so it can be reassessed and reevaluated as well. Thank you. Barb? Thank you, Chair. Um, my understanding is that the ask is, um, what we're being asked to do is to intervene in an emergency way to postpone the uh, postpone the the process in order to have further discussions about about the building maintenance. I, I think that's right, and hopefully, if it's yes. not right, then somebody will say so. Thank you, Trustee okay. Parrott. That's correct. Um, okay. So that to, again, to take um, to make a motion so that uh, you you will agree to advocate on our behalf to the province. Um, okay. Thank you, Oliver. And then Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, I was just looking at your list of, of various things that you had concerns with. I was wondering if there's any priority to those lists that we should be um, more concerned about or should be looking at or whether they're all sort of equivalent in, in your in your mind. Uh, okay. uh, personally, I would say they're all equivalent. Um, based on the, again, the committee at school, uh, the teachers, well, the entire committee, but the teachers were asked. And um, and, and one of the, the top things, of course, was auditorium. I think the top of this was auditorium. Second was gym space. Uh, and third was a whole, a whole variety of different um, options. The fashion design program for, for the uh, PAC was we heard from <coughs> countless parents about that program. And we've heard from um, even the teacher, the Home Ec Teachers Association, about how critical that program is to the to the province. It is the most successful um, uh, program in the province, fashion design program, and they say they will have trouble surviving without Eric Camper's program. And just in addition to that, uh, the alumni, alumni's position fully supports uh, PAC. That's why we're here together. Uh, but uh, the concern, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys what an auditorium meant when we all went to school because that auditorium was a gathering place, a meeting place. Uh, rarely did that happen for all the school grades, but quite often the seniors and the junior grades would meet together. It was a gathering for music, for the community as they do now, come and see fashion programs, uh, dance performances. I see elderly people at every one of these from the community enjoying, not even related to uh, Hamber musicals, uh, strings, uh, very active, just like King Ed, Used to be and Hamber's continued it. It's a huge piece of our community. It's an expectation from our community as well. Uh, but I think I have to agree, all things are equivalent. They all come together as a very important piece. We're very lucky to have the the uh, the staff overall, but definitely in the physical education department. They were trained by department heads that were our teachers at Hamber, and they were doing a good job at that time using cafeteria space, bleacher space, auditorium space, everything to make do with six classes of phys ed every single block. And they share uh, field space with the French school school on the corner as well. So and it's I, a busy location. And I think we all know, we've, I think we've all been there and uh, we've heard again from countless students that that is what's keeping them in school. The, the athletics, the teams, the fine arts, the drama, music, that is their passion. That's what they enjoy and that's why they're there. In, in a day and age where we're concerned about health and fitness and trying to support that and encourage students to become young adults and go ahead with a healthy mind and healthy body, and we will look at, sadly, the suicide rates we're seeing, those are the programs that are keeping these people, these young adults in school and engaged and in different programs, maybe not a strict academic program, maybe they're going into fashion design and lighting and work in Hollywood North. Uh, we have a lot of alumni that have gone on to many, many different areas. Jennifer. 
Thank you, um, Alan, through the chair. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm curious a little bit about, you mentioned consultation and engagement. What has happened for you to date? For the alumni? So unfortunately, the alumni have, we weren't even invited to the media release. It was very disappointing. I had actually media co contacting me saying, why aren't you here? And alumni, my phone didn't stop that week. Uh, it was very, very disappointing. Um, PAC and, well, not all PAC, some stay around, but but it's, it's just known. PAC move on when their, their <laughs> children move out, they move on. And uh, we used to have staff saying 35, 40 years but they move on to an administration moves every three to five years. The constant at Eric Camber is the alumni and we've done fundraising and philanthropic work and we have been involved for decades. So we're, you know, it's, it's just been very disappointing to us and we want to work together with everyone. And uh, um, the calls that I was receiving were anywhere from staff, retired staff, retired admin, PAC, parents, current, and students to please come on board and help. So we're here to help, definitely. Thank you, and Janet. So I'll, I'll thank you again for coming out. I know it's early in the conversation and you were talking about the city putting in some CAC or DCL money from the development that's happening in the area. Has there been any conversations with the city from your side about that? Yeah. From PAC, no, and from us as alumni, no. Unfortunately, because the alumni has been removed and not at the table, I was hesitate to take that going forward. We did hear from uh, some of the alumni have noted that uh, being involved in development in the in the area as well themselves and companies now, uh, that that is possibly a very, very good option and they have gone forward. Um, we aren't in a position yet to officially go out there and do that, but we'd ha be happy to do that. It's definitely in need of a community centre. Hillcrest is just completely uh, bursting at the seams. It's more of a destination location, but that would be an ideal area when we're looking at Heatherlands development uh, all along 33rd, the Canby Corridor, Oak Ridge uh, Mall area itself, and um, you know the transit site as well right there a couple of blocks away that full transit site uh, off of 41st all the way down to 38th will be completely developed into family housing. So it would be a great idea if we could do it, we're hoping, yeah. Thank you, Stephanie and Andrea, and thank you for insisting on making the presentation this evening um, so the trustees and the committee members can uh, gather information and, and um, understand the emergency intervention aspect of it. And it will be coming to the next committee to meeting, a planning and facilities meeting, and um, there will be, I believe, another delegation presenting possibly at that time. And then staff will presenting their report as well at that meeting. So thank you for presenting. Thank you for having us. And we've just handed out some of the most current things that have some of the events that have gone on. Uh, right. Those programs were all designed by graphic art students that created some of the um, artwork on the gym floor in that. So it just gives you a little bit of an idea of what our students are, are doing. Uh, the students that did those are five years out and out of Emily Carr now onto their careers as well. So we just wanted to share with you. Any further details that you require were both available. We welcome any further details that you might require. We'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you for having oh, us. Oh, oh, one, one before Hazel has a question. Um, through the chair, uh, I would like to thank the speakers for coming in and definitely um, helping the board um, understand the importance of these facilities to the Hamburg students. It's it is amazing. Um, but my question is. Um, since you guys have mentioned during your presentation that you were definitely left out of the conversation and there was some lack of consultation, um, if the board were to um, inter intervene, um, what kind of consultation would you like to see and how would you want teachers, staff, alumni and students to be involved? So I'm just going to clarify that um, as part of the seismic committee at, at Air Camber, the PAC is involved, two members of PAC, 
there are is administration, the VPO, the VSB, Partnerships BC, and, depart and uh, teacher department heads. So that committee met uh, for the first time in October, um, but alumni have not been included. And I think as part of this discussion was if there was ever a need for any fundraising, that we, we have to have alumni behind us. We would not be able to accomplish um, any kind of fundraising that without them. Right. So uh, in, in any event, there is there has been some consultation. It's just expedited, uh, and we're running against this timeline that uh, that you know you're going to break ground by uh, by January. So I think the alumni would like to see that we are part of that table going forward. And as Stephanie noted, um, we have many Hamber families that are philanthropic families uh, uh, that uh, we've, uh, we approached admin right after that uh, initial media release and advised that we would be happy to come forward in any way we could to assist even with fundraising and we would want, like to be included going forward. We were told that uh, that would be looked into for inclusivity, but yet we have not had any updates and we have not been brought to the table. Hamber alumni would be like to like to be a main part of this, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel, for the question. Okay, so we're going to have a five minute break. Um, and I've seen this in the past. If I can nicely ask everyone to exit because there's usually a lot of milling around to discussion because the committee still has a meeting that has to adjourn by seven. So we're, we're, we're tight on time for, for the committee. So a five minute break and we'll readjourn in five minutes. Thank you. For
All right. The next three agenda items are for information only, and the last two are items for approval requiring uh, the board to adopt at the board meeting. First item is project update with regards to the General Wolf Elementary and uh, Jim Machino, the director, will be presenting that. Thanks, Alan. Uh, this report is for information. Um, um, General Wolf Elementary is a project that's up for seismic upgrade, uh, and it's been worked on for the last couple of years um, with respect to the feasibility study. Um, General Wolf is located in the Riley Park uh, District in Vancouver. Um, the, the school does contain high-risk blocks as identified in the seismic mitigation program. Uh, the ministry did uh, approve this project to proceed and uh, project agreement uh, in July of 2018. So just flipping to the next page, um, on December 13, 2018, the VESB held an information meeting at uh, General Wolf School. Uh, at that meeting, the possible options for seismic upgrade were uh, discussed, presented, and uh, the message that was provided to the school community at that time was that the preferred option uh, would be a seismic upgrade and that the uh, children of the school uh, would be attending South Hill Education Center for the seismic upgrade of that school. Uh, General Wolf is, in, is on the Heritage Registry and uh, uh, we're pleased to say that the, the building will be, the facade will be retained for the seismic upgrade of that school and that that was the, the most cost-effective uh, solution for that seismic upgrade. The enrollment uh, projection uh, for the school is consistent at about 410 schools for the next 10 years. No changes uh, in operating capacity is proposed for this school. Uh, the PDR uh, was endorsed by the Vancouver uh, Project Office Steering Committee. Uh, the costs for the school um, for upgrading it were approximately $20.18 million. Uh, in comparison, the full replacement was $27.65 million. Uh, facility condition index for the school is 0.54. Facility condition index refers to how much deferred maintenance it has. So 0.54 is quite a bit of deferred maintenance. But with the seismic up upgrade of that school, that deferred maintenance will be reduced uh, significantly to 0.36. Uh, again, on December 13, uh, the information session was held at the school. A sign-up sheet was provided. Uh, eight, 18 people attended uh, that information open house. There's two residents, 15 parents, uh, a grandparent, and five comment forms uh, were filled in. So not a, not a lot of comment forms, but we did itemize the uh, comments that we received. That's on page two of the report. Um, so that it's there for your reading. Um, so during uh, October 2018, parents and staff met with VPO and VSB staff. In addition, another uh, meeting was conducted at the, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, prior to the December 13th date. Um, the next steps for this project is that it'll go into design and uh, followed by construction. And the anticipated completion date for this school is um, fall of 2021. So. That concludes my report. Thank you, Jim. Open up for questions, comments, with regards to Wolf. Okay, thank you. Uh, Barb? Yes? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm not on the committee, so if anybody on the committee wants to... No, go ahead. Um, I'm a new trustee, and I'm really trying very hard to understand the process for seismic upgrades. So I I just want, oops, I just want to, um, the report says, thank you. <laughs> the report says that the, um, the minister, the ministry um, supported, the, to, supported the project proceeding. So the ministry has a list of schools or do, do we, supply the list to the ministry and the ministry decides or exactly how does that work 
Uh, through the chair, that's absolutely correct. We provide a list to the ministry through our capital plan submission, and that's an annual submission that uh, prioritizes seismic upgrades for the school district. And uh, this school came up as a school uh, on that list, and it was approved to proceed by the ministry. Thank you. And then it goes, then it goes to the um, Vancouver Project Office, the VPO, and the the steering, the VPO steering committee, which I understand is two VSB and two uh, ministry people. Then uh, they determine the PDR, or what exactly do they determine? Uh, so the Vancouver School Board staff and the Vancouver Project Office, the VPO, develop what's called a project definition report, which is really a feasibility study. And that feasibility study uh, investigates a number of options uh, for the seismic upgrade of the school. It typically is a new build versus a seismic upgrade versus a partial option. Sometimes that partial option can retain some of the school and, and uh, seismically upgrade that portion and build a, a, a new portion of school. So the, you are correct. Uh, once that feasibility study is done, it goes to the Vancouver Project Office Steering Committee, which is comprised of both VSB senior management staff, uh, our secretary treasurer and our superintendent, as well as ministry uh, representations, uh, two of them. And, uh, and they uh, are tasked with the uh, decision-making uh, to endorse an option going forward. Uh, in most cases, uh, like is the case for Wolf, uh, this one was clearly the least expensive option at $20 million versus uh, 26 million, I think, uh, 27.65. And uh, it being a heritage building, uh, there was a strong uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, rationale uh, to preserve the heritage, but to get a full seismic upgrade at the same time. Um, Thank you, that helps. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Okay, I'm just going to have uh, Carmen, Estrelita, and Jennifer, and then I'll close it off at that. And then um, we have a lot of agenda items still. So, Carmen. Thank you. Through the chair, um, I just had a question regarding the uh, facility condition index. So, I know it reduces from 0.54 to 0.36. Just as a layperson, 0.36 still seems somewhat high. So, I'm wondering, is there an optimal number you try to get that to to make the project feasible? Uh, through the chair, 0.36 is still a lot of deferred maintenance. You're correct. Uh, oftentimes what we'll do when a project gets approved is we'll make submissions in our annual facilities grant in the same year to see if we can put more money into the project to try and fix up some more of those deferred maintenance items. Sometimes it's a re-roofing, sometimes it's a replacement of the mechanical uh, boiler uh, system or electrical life safety systems. So we do what we can um, to reduce that, um, that even further after the project is approved. And when we make those submissions, uh, uh, either through our capital plan, through uh, safety enhancement programs, or through our AFG, the, the ministry typically approves those because they, they know and we know that once you're in there doing the work and you have a contractor in there, it makes the most sense to do the work at that time. Thank you, Chair. And through the Chair, just a quick question. I heard fall of 2021 was completion. What is the anticipated start date? When would students actually be moved out? Uh, well, here I got it. Uh, through the chair, sorry, I just had to look look it up. Uh, it shows here that uh, that the tender award is uh, early uh, 2020. Um, so that means uh, construction would start uh, in the spring, early summer of 2020. Now, when they move over um, to the South Hill Swing site, um, I'd have to get further clarification on that. I don't know the exact date on that. So one year anticipated they would be out of the school approximately. Is that a fair assessment? from early 2020 to late 2021, uh, it could be, it, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's approximately that, yeah. Jennifer. 
Thank you, through the chair. Thank you, Jim. Um, I have just a question. It's maybe more macro around seismic in general. Um, how projected numbers, so I know in this case, the projection is consistent for students over 10 years. Um, and I know that site is fairly close to that little mountain housing development. So, and if that has a thousand or so new units, how would that affect the size of the school potentially in the long run? Would all students go to Wolf or? Through the chair, I, I'll, I can answer this question, but uh, we do have John Dawson here as well that could that might be able to help as well. Uh, when we do projections for our schools in our seismic mitigation program, we typically look 10 years out and we take a look at uh, Baragar information that's available and that's a software system that we use that very accurately uh, predicts how many kids will be in the school uh, several years out. Uh, now, just because uh, there's units being built in the area. Uh, it doesn't mean that that will create the yield rate uh, that that uh, we typically prescribe to family housing. In some instances, units are built, but none of them are sold to families. So we, we work with the city of Vancouver as well, and uh, we refine those numbers uh, to get the best, ac the most accurate um, number we can going out 10 years. Thank you, and thank you very much, uh, Jim, for that presentation on General Wolf. Uh, glad to hear that's moving ahead. Uh, the next two information items uh, will be presented by um, Director of Educational Planning, uh, John Dawson. Um, first one is with regards to the French Immersion Program Review, uh, specifically Henry Hudson. Thank you, John. Thank you, and uh, through the chair, um, as I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, assistance of my colleague, uh, Director of Instruction, Adrian Kehoe, uh, who's uh, collaborated with me on the production of this report and the uh, proposal contained therein. This uh, report is item 2.2 in your agenda, the uh, detailed report. Uh, there's a strategic plan reference to goal four to provide effective leadership, governance and stewardship for the district with the objective of effectively utilizing school and district resources and facilities. The uh, purpose of the presentation tonight is to uh, describe the proposal being made for Hudson and Strathcona, to provide uh, some rationale for the proposal, to uh, provide a summary of the decision-making process that will ensue, to describe the options that will be put forward to stakeholders for consultation, uh, to provide an indication of next steps, and then to answer questions from stakeholders. The district is proposing that the early French immersion program, currently located at Henry Hudson Elementary School, be relocated to Strathcona Elementary School. These are the five main reasons for this proposal. Uh, the pro proposal itself aligns with a recommendation from the French immersion program review that the district conducted last year. Uh, that, that review was coordinated by Adrian Keogh. And one of the recommendations from that review was that the district endeavor to uh, enroll wherever possible two kindergarten cohorts at French immersion programs. In addition, uh, current enrollment at Henry Hudson exceeds its operating capacity. Um, enrollment for is forecast to continue increasing in the Kitsilano community. And the classroom space has been uh, maximized at uh, Hudson through some facility changes over the past years. Uh, in looking at where students come from at Henry Hudson, uh, many of the students, the majority of the students, uh, uh, reside in catchments in the downtown area, Roberts, the Roberts catchment, Elsie um, Roy, and some from Crosstown. And another large contingent reside in, in Kitsilano. So Strathcona is the closest available site with the capacity to provide um, for a French immersion program and to kindergarten core intake. So the next steps in this uh, process after tonight are to begin a stakeholder consultation process. Um, once that process is concluded, staff will bring a consultation report with the results of the feedback from stakeholders back to the facilities planning committee. Uh, we anticipate that'll be in April. And following that, um, if the recommendation uh, is, achieves consensus at the facilities planning committee, it will go forward to the board for decision.
there are three options contained in the report. Uh, and these are the options that we'll be investigating through the public or stakeholder consultation process. Option number one is the status quo to uh, simply retain the current configuration at Hudson. Um, in, in the report itself, it lays out uh, a, a staff analysis of the uh, advantages and disadvantages of that option. Um, one of the clear uh, disadvantages is that um, enrollment will likely exceed capacity and so Hudson will not be able to accommodate all its English catchment students in the English program. Uh, option two is a, a gradual phase out option um, and, and the proposed start date for that is September 2020. This would allow uh, current students enrolled in the French immersion program at Hudson to remain in that program while we begin to build a program with a second quarter cohort at Strathcona. Um, so it would be a seven year process. The third option is to fully relocate the entire Hudson French Immersion Program to Strathcona in September 2020. Both um, options two and three come along with some um, enrollment choices for families. So uh, in terms of the work being done in the district, the next steps will be to continue to develop and refine the stakeholder consultation plan, which is uh, well in hand at this point. Uh, the district will seek feedback and input from stakeholders on those three options presented. And uh, we anticipate having consultation opportunities in March, uh, both in face-to-face -face open house type settings, as well as uh, with an online survey available. So in conclusion, uh, once the consultation process has been concluded, uh, district staff will return to the facilities planning committee with a cons consultation report which will include an analysis of the feedback and input gathered during that process. The uh, consultation report will contain a recommendation from district staff regarding which option, one, two, or three, we're recommending the board uh, consider. And out of that meeting, a motion may proceed to the board for a decision. That's the conclusion of my report, open for questions. Thank you, John, for a very clear report. Um, and you, you, you skip past a, a lot of the charts and the graphs that gives a clear understanding of, of the capacity of um, Strathcona and the capacity of, uh, of Hudson as well in history and future forecasts. So thank you for that. Just open it up for questions, comments, and uh, also be aware that um, <coughs> There's no decisions on this. This is, we're just the first step of gathering the information um, with the community and, and the school as well. So, Anne, thank you. And did you, we'll take one question at a time? Yeah. Okay, so let's, um, if you have, let's let's go with three questions and then we'll, we'll come back if, um, if any other members have questions. So first question with regards to childcare space at Hudson, right? No, at, at Strathcona. At Strathcona, okay, very good. Um, Thank you, Adrian. Through the chair, so that is part of the con the purpose of our consultation is to see the facilities that are currently in operation at Strathcona and the community partners that exist there, and we will endeavor to get that information through the process. And, and through, through the chair, I, just a point of clarification: I believe it's out of school care at Hudson, so it's a care that be occurs before and after school for school age children. Uh, to clarify, that's before and after school, right? Yeah. Um, one of the other questions is, and I have to ask it, yes. what sort of consultation can be expected with the parents of both Hudson and Strathcona? Um, through the chair, so we're planning to run uh, parallel consultation processes for both communities. 
Um, there will be one formal open house uh, in each community in early March. There will be, uh, we're still developing final details, but we intend to have pop-up sessions uh, at the school to encourage the community to provide feedback. We'll also be having materials at the school for distribution to parents. But the main feedback mechanism and the feedback that will be analyzed will be the feedback that's provided through the online survey. And of course, we'll make that survey accessible at the um, open houses with paper as necessary or iPads. So um, that's that's our uh, an outline of our, of our plan for consultation. Uh, one more. Sure. All right, any other member? Jill, and then Barb. Uh, through the chair, uh, this is maybe sort of in line with um, Anne's question, but uh, just wondering what that, the space that's available at Strathcona at this time, what is that space currently being used for um, within that school community? So uh, we're talking about uh, school organization for September 2020. So I think it's a little bit premature to you know, start to get into details of how space at Strathcona might be used at that point. So that, as uh, Mr. Keo indicated, will be part of the consultation process and developing a better, better understanding of the facility, because there are actually five buildings on the Strathcona site. Any follow-up question, Jill? Um, another question. Um, I noticed in the report, um, just, well, this may be... Um, the question being, um, hope when the when the final decision is made, um, I, it looks like it may be, um, you know, sometime this year. But we're just that teachers would be concerned that the final decision would be made well in advance of um, what we currently have as a transfer transfer deadline, so that teachers had some choice about whether um, at at the Hudson at Hudson School whether or not they wanted to stay um, in a and if it if it is just a single track school, whether they stay within the English track or they want to um, access positions outside of the school, you know, hopefully in French immersion. Thank you for for the committee members. Is there a specific date for that final transfer? Uh, March fifteenth is the deadline to submit a transfer. Okay. Thank you. That's coming up. Um, Barb, Jennifer. And then Lois. Thank you, Chair. Um, from the data, I, I think that 62% of the French immersion students at Henry Hudson are out of the catchment. Do we know what the uh, amount of, in the English part of the school, um, what the out of catchment percentage is of students who attend Henry Hudson out of catchment? So through the chair, um, Henry Hudson has been, um, I guess, categorized as a full school uh, in terms of English program enrollment for several years due to the uh, number of kindergarten catchment applicants exceeding the space of the school, which means that the school does not uh, admit cross boundary applicants. Uh, you do see when you look at the upper grades that most schools, even though schools are full, that there are out of catchment students there. That's often because uh, residences change over the years. Um, but there are very few out of catchment students at Henry Hudson right now. I, I don't have an exact number, but happy to provide that in the future. Jennifer. Thank you. Through the chair. Thanks, John. Um, just a question around um, sort of all the parts of the puzzle here. So there's the kindergarten pressure, there's the French immersion spaces, and long-term or medium-term seismic. So I'm just curious too, like in reading the report, that the seismic would be also the same or similar capacity. So um, how is it that there's pressures for kindergarten and French immersion and then the plans further down the line are the same size? So this is more of a, a seismic question. But the, the ministry commits to building schools to accommodate the catchment enrollment for schools generally. So we have surplus capacity, as we've discussed in some orientation sessions. So the ministry um, is, is challenged by increasing capacity in a catchment when, sur when surplus capacity exists elsewhere in the district. So the, the perspective may be that um, the district should review the location of district programs uh, rather than building a larger school 
to accommodate this, this program that's located there already. Okay. Lois? Thank you, Chair. Um, through the Chair, uh, I'm wondering if you can tell me whether there is currently a wait list of, uh, for English catchment um, in kindergarten intake, um, and um, if not, based on current projection, do we know how long before wait lists and notary system will uh, will happen? Thank you, and through the Chair. Uh, my understanding is that um, there was a wait list um, during the enrollment, spring enrollment period last year. By the time school opened or by the t end of September, that wait list was cleared for Hudson last year. I believe there was um, a total of somewhere in the mid 50s to 60 applicants total at Hudson last year for kindergarten. I, I did happen to check today in our online system. At, at present, there are 77 kindergarten applicants for, for Hudson. Um, and the application period is still open for a few more days. Um, so there will be uh, 40 spaces, a maximum of 40 kindergarten spaces. So hard to say whether that will materialize in a wait list. Some of those students will go to choice programs. But uh, with the growth of the enrollment in that area, we're fully anticipating, if not this year, there will be a wait list next, next year. Uh, I kind of think, based on that number, there will likely to be a wait list this year. Janet? Um, I think it would be helpful to know um, what is the situation for teachers if a district program moves? Do they have the option to move with the program? Do they have the option to stay at the um, school? You know, as uh, was suggested, they stay in the English stream. Um, I don't know if there's, there must be rules around that sort of thing. I'm just curious of what they are. I see two staff with big smiles wanting to answer that question. Um, Carmen, okay. Thank you. Through the chair, there is language in the collective agreement which delegates what is considered a district program and district staff. At this time, the French immersion program, it would not be considered district staff. So those employees have a right to remain at their work site um, uh, based on the language that's in the collective agreement today. Follow-up question, Anna? A, a separate question. Okay. I, I'm a little surprised that French immersion is not a district program, but if that's in the agreement, then, then that's the way it is. Um, there was discussion about having uh, options for two kindergarten cohorts in different French immersion schools. And I'm just wondering if there is any other school in the district that has the capacity to have a second cohort added to it. Hmm. So um, as background research for this report, we did look at several other uh, potential locations. And um, I, I, I don't think there are any other locations available. And Strathcona stood out also because of its proximity to where the students live that are currently attending the program. So uh, Adrian, do you have, a, you have additional insight? If I can pop. We have some additional slides that might help uh, provide context. You want to, is that back one, back one. Thank you, through the chair. So this outlines the 13 elementary schools that house kindergarten French immersion programs. So currently seven of the 13 have only one kindergarten division. In previous years, we had two in most of our divisions, but during the time of the teacher shortage, we did reduce the kindergarten intake two years ago. We're continuing to manage that with the shortage of teachers. So we currently have seven sites that have only one kindergarten site. We've looked at all seven of those. And for reasons outlined in the report, Hudson, was, Hudson and Strathcona was the closest pairing. So this is the first phase of the implementation of the French Immersion Program Review. And there be, it would be continued efforts over the years to sustain the program through that model of endeavoring to have two in each of the sites where the program is offered. Jennifer, then Carmen. Yeah, thanks. So um, thank you for explaining some of the pieces around um, both the spaces for regular learning, but also it sounds like so out of school care is a consideration um, as well as transportation to possibly get to Strathcona. Um, but also I'm wondering what are some of the impacts that we might already know of on the receiving school? So knowing the needs of Strathcona and the students there and some ideas that we might have already. 
thank you. So through the chair, I think those um, details will emerge out of the consultation process. Um, but just you know, note that Strathcona already has a French immersion program, so the school community would have an understanding of the needs of those students already. So we're talking about a program expansion at Strathcona rather than introducing a new program. And Carmen. Thank you, through the chair. Um, maybe this might be a question for Carmen Batista. Just given that we do have a shortage of French teachers already, is there a concern that if we move Hudson to Strathcona and some of those teachers choose to stay with the English program rather than following along with French, that then we have reduced our overall number of French teachers? Through the chair, um, there is a possibility. We have a lot of French immersion teachers uh, that in our district that actually teach other things, and, and that is their choice to do as they post and fill through different positions. So that is a possibility. Hazel. Um, through the chair, just to clarify my understanding of the choice for in the enrollment in EFI at Strathcona. Um, it states that where catchment waitlist exists, students returning from Hudson EFI program will be placed behind catchment students who have already applied to attend the school. So if, if a lot of students from Strathcona were to be applying to the um, EFI, which would be moved to their school, would that mean um, Hudson students outside of the catchment would not would be waitlisted in in order to give priority to the Strathcona students. Is that a question with regards to the capacity? I guess that Strathcona, if I'm reading that. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So it's always difficult to express some of the minutiae of enrollment procedures. Um, but what that one refers to is the possibility that rather than going to Strathcona, a, HUD, a, a student currently enrolled in the Hudson French Immersion Program might wish to go back to their home school, such as Roberts or, or Gordon or Elsie Roy. So what it's saying is that at Elsie Roy, as the example, there's already a wait list. So those Hudson students wouldn't be able to jump to the front of that wait list, but they could be added to the wait list. So the school has space, their catchment school, they would undoubtedly take the student, but a lot of those schools have wait lists. So therefore the Hudson students would be put on that wait list if they wanted to return to their English catchment school. Follow up question, Hazel? So, yeah, since the wait list exists, the Hudson students would still be like put as a priority within Strathcona? Yeah, sorry, with my... Um, so currently none of the Hudson students attend Strathcona. So I'm talking about the schools um, that they do attend, which are Roberts, Crosstown, Elsie Roy, Hudson itself, where they could, there's a guarantee they could stay at Hudson in the English program there, uh, Gordon, and a few others scattered around the Hudson area. Oh, okay, I clarify? see, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that clarified. Okay, one last question, Jennifer and Janet, and then myself. Thank you. Through the chair. So, yes, the, I understand the impact on the existing French students at um, Strathcona. I was also wondering about the other students and knowing the designation of Strathcona Elementary and if there would be any perceived impacts of services to the non-French um, students at Strath or maybe future seismic plans at Strathcona as well for that building E. Mm. Yeah, um, again, I think that those type of concerns will be emerged throughout the consultation process. Um, once a decision is made, there's also a, a planning process. That's one of the reasons there's an additional year in this timeline. So the type of things where you're designing support for students are often, you know, they emerge through a consultation process, but the actual work to provide those supports is designed and delivered in that planning year ahead of a change. Janet. So I'm just curious, um, you know, I know there's a lot of a desire to expand the French Immersion <coughs> Programme. I'm wondering if our recruitment is in a place where we could start to expand the programme or whether we could not, whether there are not sufficient teachers available to have a, to increase sustainably the programme we have in our district. Sounds like an Adrian question or Harmon. Sure, through the chair, thank you. 
So currently, we have qualified French immersion teachers in all of our classes, and we do not feel comfortable expanding at the moment. There's lots of interest and lots of wait lists in all of our French immersion schools, but we currently do not have enough teachers to expand the program to the original uh, numbers that we had two years ago. So we're continuing to recruit um, weekly over the next few several weeks and all year. Thank you. Thank you. So let's just close it off. I got a call with regards to, and this might be going out a little, uh, with regards to tennis and if if this proceeds, the request if uh, with regards to moving to a tennis and uh, French immersion, is there a priority will be set or or would Tennyson be full with their own catchment? Through the chair. So currently Tennyson is full. And as laid out in the report, there are four, at the moment, there are four re-enrollment options, which include families who have children currently enrolled in French immersion at Hudson. They could apply to any of the other French immersion sites. So if we go to the one other slide, sorry, you could share yeah. that. Um, so this slide just outlines where they're the hottest spots in terms of the numbers of wait, kids on the wait list. So <laughs> in the west side of the city, for example, Trafalgar, Kilchenna, Kirsa, they have more space uh, than more spaces available currently than in the other schools. So all families are, will be offered the opportunity to apply to any of those other sites where there are French programs, Thank including you. Tennyson. <laughs> Thank you. And, and a bit of additional information, uh, as part of background research, I think we identified that there's over 150 spaces in the, particularly in the uh, intermediate grades, grades four to seven, in French immersion programs that could potentially accommodate students from Hudson. Thank you. All right, um, so I'm closing it off this evening, but uh, the consultation process begins, consultation and feedback. And as outlined with one of the first questions, um, uh, they'll be at um, both schools parallel and ongoing online uh, uh, feedback to be received. Uh, sorry, I should ask Anne, did you have any follow-up questions before we move on? The only other thing that um, we were wondering, or, um, and again, we sort of talked a bit about it, is um, what does the, the, move over to Stratcona. Um, the timeline of the re-enrollment options will be affected. And again, it comes back constantly to the boundary reviews, to the fact that so many schools are full and you're pitting families against families that all live around the school versus families who have sent one child there and now they want their younger sibling to go there. But it, it's such a a huge issue, as we all know, about trying to decide who gets priority. And I think that's something that the trustees and everybody else are still going to have to figure out how best to work this out so that the fewer amount of families as possible are interrupted or traumatized by not being able to get their kids into their attachment schools. Really question. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. I was waiting, but uh, I appreciate that. Um, so, oh, Janet, I'll just insert one more quick question. Uh, there was a there was an answer about the consultation that will happen at the two schools. Will there be a check in with the PACs and the teachers and the uh, school community ahead of the consultation to make sure that it's a good fit? Specific groups. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's part of the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for uh, the, the report. And I, I, I love the charts and graphs. Always, always very easy to understand and helpful. So there are the three options that will be going out um, for discussion and consultation. Okay. And this will come back, I believe, in April. Thank you. Uh, next item is the update with regards to kindergarten enrollment priorities when existing catchment boundaries are changed. All right, I'll, yeah. uh, well, let's have a three minute, <laughs> three minute break. <laughs> so people.
I may? Yes. I'm freezing. Do you think it's possible to get a little bit more heat in here? I don't know who that to direct that to. Time we finish. Coming back. Um, all right, three items left. Uh, one item for information, and the last two are requiring uh, board approval, but those are those are not contentious. So uh, back to John Dawson, Director of Educational Planning, with regards to the updated kindergarten enrollment priorities when existing catchment boundaries are changed. So this is um, a long-standing uh, item. Uh, but I think that we're talking something very specific, a specific item tonight. So I'll pass it to John. Thank you. And uh, thank you through the chair. Um, this is item 2.3 in the agenda. And there is uh, there is an attachment uh, with this item, um, which is Administrative Procedure uh, 305, which is in draft form right now. And it contains the, um, uh, the draft of the updates outlined in this report. Um, this report also pertains to strategic plan goal number four to provide effective leadership, governance and stewardship in the district with the objective of effectively, effectively utilizing school district resources and facilities. Uh, okay, the purpose of this report is to uh, describe the analysis done by the district and inform the committee of the proposed revision to kindergarten enrollment priorities contained in AP 305. Um, this this report was um, is linked to a motion that was approved by the board uh, last June. The motion was the staff conduct a detailed review of current enrollment policies governing catchment adjustments and registration slash enrollment to identify possible revisions to current policies, taking into consideration feedback received to the catchment review consultation that occurred last spring. <coughs> The proposal um, that comes along with this report is uh, the revised Administrative Procedure 305, and which is attached. And this um, procedure has been to the working group uh, as a draft for feedback. And uh, the next step is to go before the Policy and Governance Committee. I believe the meeting is February 7th as a draft for um, review and approval. So the analysis or the, the considerations um, in this proposal are the following. We looked at uh, feedback from the consultation process conducted during the boundary review, um, conducted uh, a large scale analysis of the number of kindergarten applicants on an annual basis who do have an older sibling. Um, those would be siblings that are attending the same elementary school, uh, not just an older sibling, say a grade outside of an elementary school grade. So it'd be grade one to six siblings attending the same school. And then we've also um, looked at enrollment priorities in other metro districts. There were many um, questions uh, asked of the public and stakeholders in the um, consultation process last spring. Uh, one of the questions was about what could be done to mitigate the impact of boundary adjustments for families. Um, 71% of those who answered that question indicated that some sort of grandparenting provisions for kindergarten siblings would be desirable to mitigate the impact of boundary adjustments. There were about 300 respondents to that question. We have a large data set of, from five years of uh, kindergarten choice applications. Um, and so as part of that application process, uh, families indicate whether an older sibling is attending the same choice program and that information is verified at the school level. So um, very consistent data over those five years, about uh, an average of 22% of kindergarten choice applicants have an older sibling on an annual basis applying to attend that program. Um, we have preliminary data from this year's online enrollment for kindergarten. This is the first year we've run that web service 
And so uh, right now, just under 30% of regular or English program kindergarten applicants for their catchment schools have an older sibling. Um, sometimes uh, parents filling out that application or doing the online process aren't clear about the parameters around what an older sibling is. So sometimes they might say they, they have an older sibling not understanding that siblings in high school. So that is that number is probably a bit high to what it, the actual number of older siblings is. So we, we've made an estimate of somewhere in the middle that about a quarter of kindergarten applicants each year have an older sibling enrolled at the same school. We surveyed or canvassed, I should, should say, some surrounding districts. Um, fairly unanimous in their approach to this problem. Um, all the districts have some sort of grandparenting provision, all of these districts have some sort of grandparenting provision in their procedures um, to accommodate families once a boundary has been adjusted. This is the uh, wording of the updated enrollment priorities that are found in Admin Procedure 305. So uh, first one is kindergarten siblings of continuing catchment students attending concurrently who register at their catchment school by January 31st. That's an existing priority. The new one is the second one. Kindergarten siblings of continuing attending <laughs> students attending concurrently who are now non-catchment as a result of a boundary change who register at their English catchment school by January 31st. And then finally, the third one is the same as always, other kindergarten catchment students without siblings. So that, so there are, that identifies there are some boundaries around sibling priority um, and, and they're stated in those, uh, in those bullets. Well, that indicates this report is uh, completed, so <laughs> open for questions. Once again, very clear that it's, uh, it's the end. Thank you, John, for that, uh, that report. Um, open it up for questions, comments. Uh, first question I have, John, is the whole purpose of that discussion, and it, it went on, it's kind of challenging because it went over a election period as well for the trustees. Um, so the, the impacts, and, and I agree with this direction, um, always did, with regards to grandparenting um, siblings. The Going in this direction, the, the impacts of that with regards to the purpose of that catchment change, can you give us a feeling or idea of, of, of the, the negative impacts of, of this direction? Sure. So through the chair, um, boundary adjustment is, is always going to be, or usually going to be a slow process to adjust enrollment because you're, you're, if, you, if you adjust a boundary by 25% of the, you know, of a catchment area, that's pretty significant. And yet you're only uh, really changing enrollment by, you know, a quarter of the kindergarten intake per year. So if you have a school like such as Hudson um, with 40 kindergarten students, um, you might have 15 applicants coming from a quarter of the catchment. That was what it was last year. So in the end, perhaps there'd be 10 fewer students there on an annual basis. So it takes several years for the, the impact of boundary adjustment to, to take hold. With the addition of this, these provisions, that will slow the process further. So boundary adjustment, in, especially in areas where um, there are schools adjacent to each other that are full, it's going to be a challenge in Vancouver to resolve some of the enrollment challenges, you know, difficulties at full schools, um, which are in areas that are adjacent to other full schools. So that looking at Hudson and doing that analysis, um, one of the other things that's in AP 305 is the commitment by the district to review the location of district programs prior to looking at boundary adjustment as a mechanism to resolve enrollment challenges. So, to, you know, to summarize the answer, these provisions are, are very, um, I think they recognize the disruptive nature of bound, uh, boundary adjustments to families, but they would also slow down the impact of boundary adjustments to resolve enrollment challenges. Okay. Uh, clear balance and thank you for that, the direction. Uh, Barb. Thank you, Chair. Is uh, the number two, which is, I understand is a new one, it implies that um, students 
who uh, who are no longer in the attach in the ca catchment because of the boundary change will will be able to stay in the school. Is that correct? Through the chair, the intent is if they wish to stay in the school and they have an older sibling still attending the school, yes, they would have a priority. I'm talking about the older sibling. So the older, if I'm understanding you correctly, the older sibling has continuing status at the school. So, so in our in our past practice, there was never an intention to uh, remove students with continuing status at a school through a boundary adjustment process. So if you happen to live in an area that's now outside the catchment, our intention was never to say, okay, now you're attending the next door school. Oh, okay. Um, that, that was, some districts do do that. That's been an approach used in, in Surrey, particularly in high growth areas. Um, and that raises the point that there is a, there is quite a, this is in quite a box. So this doesn't um, refer to what might happen when we open a new school. So we need to, you know, further work is to look at how we manage enrollment when we open a new school. And the new school is, you know, most likely to come on stream as soon as the school of Harbour downtown. So we're going to have to approach that and look at that carefully. Thank you. Janet? Do we, um, then, have we had the situation in the past where um, the siblings of the currently enrolled students have not been able to enroll at the school? Yeah. <laughs> That, that situation has never yet arisen. We've been kind of waiting for that day at a couple of our schools, but so far, thankfully, we've never had to use a draw process for um, kindergarten applicants with older siblings. All right, thank you. Thank you, John, for the report and uh, the direction of the AP. Thank you. Um, the last two items are requiring board approval, which will be going to the board. Um, first one is the Fleming Elementary BC Hydro statutory right of way. And I think Jim's going to be presenting both yes. reports. Thank you. First one. Uh, through the chair, uh, these are more administrative in nature, but they do require board approval. Um, it's not atypical when we do a, a new school or a replacement school that we have to call up BC Hydro and get a new service for that new school. Um, uh, and this is the case in this first report. Um, Fleming Elementary is a school that's uh, under construction. Uh, it's part of the seismic mitigation program. It's a replacement school. Uh, the school is being located quite a distance from the existing school. So it made sense to uh, for Hydro to bring in a new service line for the new school. Uh, every time Hydro brings in a new service line, uh, they request a right-of-way. A right-of-way is uh, a tool um, that's um, registered in land titles that allows BC Hydro to come in and make repairs to that line or that transformer box that's sitting on our property. This is relatively routine. Um, we've done a number of these at, at this table, um, and we will continue to bring these back um, uh, as new schools are replaced through the seismic mitigation program. So the report uh, does, again, contain a recommendation, and um, it's anticipated uh, that the replacement school be done by uh, June 2019. And uh, typically, we, um, the recommendation is that the board authorizes Secretary Treasurer to sign the statutory right-of-way on their behalf. That's the end of my report. Janet, question? So it's not entirely re directly related to what you're saying, but uh, to this report. But the, the idea is that this is a new statutory right of way because there's a new school in a new location on the property. So I'm assuming there's an old statutory right of way going to the old school. Does BC Hydro give up the old statutory right of way once a new one's in place, or do they just now have two? Uh, through the chair, yeah. One would be once that old service is taken out, so in, in the case of Fleming, uh, once we move into the new building and we decommission the old building and demolish it, we then take that service out and then we uh, negotiate with uh, BC Hydro to remove that statutory right of way for that old line because the transformer box would no longer be required. Okay. The, the removal doesn't have to come to the board. I've never seen it come to the board. Okay, thanks. I guess uh, full support for that going to the board. Yeah. No, thank you. All right, final item. Uh, I think, how do you pronounce that? Kaya? 
Kaya Lee Spilaw. Jim. Uh, thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, the Vancouver Board of Education uh, has hosted provincial resource programs on behalf of the province for over 20 years. Um, because we have the authority, um, we have the leasing experience, we have a um, rentals and leases department, uh, we act as an agent for a number of, um, of, of, of groups that are provincial in nature. Some of them are housed in this building. In this instance, Kaya uh, has been in the building and their lease needed to come up for renewal. So we assisted uh, uh, Kaya in the renegotiation of that lease. So the purpose of this report um, um, is that, um, that, um, that the Kaya lease be extended at current market rates. Uh, they're in a location, I believe that's uh, just uh, around Canby and uh, Marine Drive. Um, but in order to do that, um, a bylaw is required. So um, there is an attached bylaw form uh, to the report uh, that spells out um, the specifics of the Kaya lease. Uh, and uh, we do need a recommendation to go to the board um, that's read three times. Uh, the board can make the decision to read all those readings at the same night. So I'm, I'm just going to go through the recommendation on this. It's recommended the Board of Education of School District 39 um, 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 the, uh, well, that the Board of Education School District 39 uh, Kaya Lease Acquisition Bylaw B read a first time 28th, second time the 28th, uh, and a third time the 28th uh, for the, the next uh, board meeting, which is on the 28th of January. And there's further a uh, couple more paragraphs there uh, for that bylaw to be passed. Very good, Jim. Uh, thank you. So uh, I guess we all support that going to the board. Yes, yes. Uh, Jennifer has a question. Just one question um, about that space. Is there a possibility that they would use other space in the district or does it have to be this exact space? Uh, we did discuss this with Kaya a, a, a while back to see whether there was an interest in them either moving into this building or some of our school space, but they really like the space that they're in. It's the great the location is great for them to offer their services. So it's their preference and it's at their discretion uh, and to, to stay in the space that they're in. Secretary Treasurer. Oh, perhaps um, Assistant Secretary Treasurer Landry could answer, address the issue of uh, the fact that we, um, we are paying that lease to have them not in one of our facilities. She'll explain why that is. Thank you, through the chair. Um, we will be, um, we do not pay for um, the cost of this lease. Uh, it is a provincial resource program, which is fully funded by the Ministry of Ed, so it is not a line item in our budget. And so it will be funded um, through that program. And as well, uh, Kaya tends to want to be close to the other provincial resource programs like SETBC, because um, a lot of their um, a lot of their work uh, has the same clients. So it's helpful for them to be both near the airport and also near the other provincial resource programs. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can entice them at the next when it comes up. All right, um, so support goes to the board for that. And one last item that's, I guess there's not enough space on this page, but uh, items for information for the next meeting. Uh, anybody have any items, requests? Okay, no, thank you very much uh, for coming out and attending. Uh, a lot of the items today are of, um, of uh, consultation early stages, so. More to come at the next committee meeting, which is Wednesday, February 13th. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight.